Folks, I want to welcome you to another Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Before we get rolling, I want to introduce uh, one of our longtime members, Wayne Potter, with a brief announcement. Hi. I uh, have been a member for, of the forum for a number of years now, and uh, over the last six or seven years, I've also belonged to an organization called Friendship Force International with a local club called Friendship Force Columbia Cascade. It's one of about 360 clubs around the world that promote um, understanding uh, of, the, of the world's people uh, by involving ourselves with those people in their homes. And uh, what we do is we visit those individuals in their homes for a week and, uh, and we hopefully keep in touch with them and then also we have an opportunity for them to come here. A recent visit I made was to Vladivostok, Russia, Ulan Ude, uh, was in Siberia. We went to Mongolia, stayed with families all along the way and uh, your view about how the world is working <laughs> changes because of the nature of the fact you're living in their home, you're meeting their families, you're seeing how they work. And so <clears throat> our local organization has uh, put together a, an annual event which is called uh, World Friendship Day. And it's a, to celebrate the birthday of Friendship Force International, which was initially supported and established with Jimmy Carter, President Carter. And uh, our event uh, will be coming up in Vancouver on the 15th, which is a Saturday from 11.30 till about three. And we'll be having uh, an opportunity, hopefully, to meet a variety of organizations that can tell us what they think is important in terms of their, their pro similar programs uh, and I'm looking forward, actually, in trying to promote working with sister cities, the World Affair Council, the Scandinavian Heritage Foundation, Rotary, Lions Clubs International, and so on, whereby working together, we can help promote better world understanding. So I put on the back uh, the flyers like this, if you have any interest at all. This shows where it is and what it is and so on. Uh, we hope that uh, it'll involve a meal. Uh, it'll involve some uh, wonderful traditional Scandinavian music uh, from some, a band located in Oregon, and hopefully a chance to uh, understand some of the kind of things that Friendship Force is doing uh, today. Uh, you can sign up <laughs> to go different places and learn how to buy, how, learn how, how to learn about how to interact with individuals coming into the uh, area. So thank you. Uh, you know, ask me questions or look at the flyer. Thank you, Wayne. Folks, I want to uh, acknowledge that we've got a couple, at least one PCC board member here, Deanna Palm. You want to wave, say hi? Do we have any more, more PCC board members in the room? Don't want to be acknowledged publicly? OK. Um, well, then you can hide. Not for long. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, just say, hey, PCC has been great to me. I first started PCC in uh, 1983, and it was 2010 when I got my degree. So I want to thank them for their patience. <laughs> they were very, they're very, very, very generous with their patience with me. And uh, uh, but I, I did graduate with a Phi Theta Kappa diploma, and uh, so that was uh, kind of nice. It was some resume jewelry that. Uh, only took 27 years, but it was really nice to have. I uh, want to just uh, kick out a couple brief announcements. In two months or two weeks, the mud starts slinging here. The campaign season will start, and I'm sure it's going to be very interesting through the uh, balance of March. And uh, also a big thank you to John Leeper. It was John Leeper who made the suggestion that we bring Dr. Brown here today. And I want to thank you because it was an excellent suggestion. And uh, as I signal Dr. Brown to maybe make his way up here, I want to thank Kate Chester. There's a true professional in the public relations industry, and she is one of them. She made a lot of the behind-the-scenes work uh, 
smooth as silk. And sometimes uh, behind the scenes, it's absolute chaos and pandemonium. And that was work with her was just the antithesis of that. And it just makes uh, this a very comfortable, easy introduction. So I ask of you just one thing. Would you please put your hands together and warmly welcome Dr. Jeremy Brown. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation to be here. It is actually um, delightful to have the opportunity to talk about something I feel, feel very passionate about, which is higher education, uh, especially community colleges, and, and of course, especially PCC. I should, um, I guess, reiterate the remarks that were said earlier about Deanna Palm just being not just a board member, but really being so active in our community and being a, a tremendous force behind uh, putting PCC out there in the community and letting people know all of the wonderful things that are happening on campus. So I'm um, delighted that Deanna is here also. And, and again, to reiterate that Kate has done a great job making me look good. So you can imagine how hard that is. Um, but she does do a terrific job. And, and Rob Wagner is also here uh, representing PCC. And, and also Heidi Edwards uh, from our Rock Creek campus, a newer, one of the newer additions to uh, to our campus. So let me t tell you all, uh, a variety of different things about what's going on at PCC, but um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about ancient history. Um, you've probably already figured out by now that I'm not originally from the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> if not, then I'll uh, try to use more of the Queen's vernacular um, to emphasize that. I'm originally from uh, England, or as I might say, the, the very eastern tip of Long Island. If you go to Long Island and you keep swimming, then you'll get to my, my uh, home of birth. The, um, I guess most recently I was uh, living in Long Island as president of Dowling College. Before that, I was president of Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania. And then before that, I was in upstate New York as vice president of one of the State University of New York campuses. So this is my first job out here on the West Coast, and, and frankly, uh, my wife and the five-year-old are having a fantastic time, so thank you so much for just giving us such a great Pacific Northwest welcome to a, to a wonderful community. And uh, we're delighted to be here. I've survived one summer and one winter, and trust me, when you um, don't have to deal with 200 inches of snow a year, then this is a great place to live, so <laughs> great about that. A um, little bit about my family. Um, I have a five-year-old son, Andrew who is in kindergarten, and so I'm starting to learn a lot more about the K through 12 system through his eyes and, and through the eyes of my wife, Rebecca, who is from Panama. So we have a fully bilingual home, and uh, so it's tremendous when we have the opportunity to, to raise a five-year-old in, in a bilingual atmosphere. Um, I think probably should tell you that I've lived most of my um, life now in the United States. Most of my education, however, was uh, in England. And I benefited greatly from the government's uh, support of higher education in that I actually did get a free education in England, both undergraduate and graduate work. So you can see the similarities in terms of, had that not been the case, I probably would have been a student like any of our 90,000 students at Portland Community Colleges. I would have started out at community college and then perhaps transferred to a four-year institution. So I really do know the transformative power of higher education as well as, of course, sensi sensitive to the, uh, the financial strains that sometimes trying to get an education puts on students. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Academically, um, my background is in nuclear physics. I have a doctorate in nuclear physics uh, from the University of Birmingham in England. And my undergraduate degree also was in physics from the University of Birmingham. And then I spent a few years um, doing research, both at Indiana University in the state of Indiana, and then also had a faculty position at Princeton University on the East Coast in New Jersey. Um, that was also uh, punctuated by a year uh, on sabbatical leave, teaching and doing research at the University of Oxford back in England, which cured me of, of, uh, of ever complaining about American food again. If, as I always say, English cuisine is now one of my favorite oxymorons, so <laughs> you have to go and try it for yourself, so trust me. Um, but I really do think that the opportunities that we have here in the United States for education are really um, phenomenal, and a lot of it hinges on 
not only affordability but also accessibility, which brings in the, the whole concept of community college being an integral part of the higher educational system in the United States. So starting July 1st, what was the first thing I did? The first day uh, in the office, I went to probably about 10 different sites around our district. Our district is about the same size as Rhode Island. So it's kind of amazing when you think about the differences in the different areas that we have. We have a site down in Newburgh, for example, in the very southwest. And then Sylvania campus, uh, one of our largest campuses. And then up to Hillsborough, Willow Creek, Rock Creek, across uh, the river, oh, sorry, no, then to the, uh, the downtown center, then the metro center, the Cascade campus, southeast center, a lot of busy times during that first day. And, and it sort of really impressed upon me not just the size of our institution of 90,000 students, but also the diversity of our populations and the communities that we serve, which really makes this a very exciting job. And since July 1st, I've been smart enough to realize that um, it's better to listen than to speak as you try to get a better handle on what PCC does and, and how, it, um, how it might be better. The other nugget that I've learned from other positions is that the person before you was really smart and did some things really well. So don't go in and make changes from day one. Don't go in and make changes just for the sake of making changes and stamping your own sort of uh, image on the institution, but figure out what was working well and keep those things, or just maybe tweak them a little bit and then look for other opportunities. As we always say in higher education, we, we, we don't like change very much. Uh, most businesses are like that. We're kind of scared about change, so especially initially, don't come in and make too many changes. So we've not made too many changes initially. We've started to just take stock of where we are, and uh, we'll come back and visit on that in a second. So I've been visiting around in the district, uh, meeting folks at PCC, also spending a good amount of time in the community, talking to, to people like you, different fora, and also opportunities to, to get out there and, and hear about what the community college does to serve its community, and what the community college could do to better serve its community. And, and it's really important that we recognize, certainly at PCC, who we serve and, and what the needs are rather than us telling our community, this is what we have, and this is what we have. And if you don't like it, then we're sorry. But it's more like, tell us what you would like, and let's see how we can make those things happen for you. Then, of course, spending a, a good amount of time uh, around the state of Oregon, and also down in Salem, meeting with our friends in the legislature, talking about our needs and, and our challenges, so to speak. So that's been really exciting. I guess the other thing that I find really fascinating, for want of a better word, is what exactly is a community college and trying to define that. We were formed in 1961, so we've been around for 53 years, and in that time we have evolved into a very different institution than we were at our inception. And I think it's actually um, it's actually difficult for any one person to fully gauge the extent of our penetration into the community as well as to understand the breadth of the offerings and the students that we serve. Community colleges now in the 21st century are very, very different and they will continue to evolve as our mission grows and our um, responsibility expands. Let me give you an example for, exa uh, for, uh, for good reason that, um, that will become obvious as we think about the economy. That in the United States, 45% of all undergraduates are at community colleges. 45%. And, and probably if you'd have asked me what that number was a few years ago, I would never have come up with 45%. It's a growing number for, for a variety of reasons. Also, uh, the things that we offer are very different than when we first started. For sure, we still offer one-year certificate programs, two-year uh, associate degree programs, a lot of vocational training, but we also offer courses for people who need to improve their English, ESL, English as a Second Language. 
We also offer GED for those folks who don't have a high school diploma or adult basic education. We also offer workforce development for those businesses who want to train their workforce to adapt to changes in, in their industry or retrain people who, uh, who need a uh, different set of skills and individuals who are displaced from their jobs who want to uh, learn a new skill so they can go back into the workforce or people who just like to learn a, a different skill. So a good example of that is that um, you know, if you get a technical degree and you go to work in business, then after a while, if you're very good, you keep getting promoted and promoted, and then sometimes uh, you will get promoted into management. And that's not necessarily what you were trained to do. So people need to be trained uh, to meet those changing nature of their responsibilities. So we meet those. We also do a lot of work in small business development. We also do a lot in terms of community education. So it, it's a very broad range of offerings that we provide. And as you might imagine, then, we also have students who come from very different backgrounds. We have students who come straight out of high school. They come out of high school because they want to get a certificate. They want to learn how to weld. They want to be a machinist. They want to be um, a technician in a vet lab. Uh, or they want to see this as a stepping stone to getting a four-year degree. Uh, we had last year about 4,000 students who transferred from PCC to Portland State. We had uh, several hundred, about um, 430 who transferred to Oregon State and over 700 who transferred to the University of Oregon. So we're also seen, in essence, as being the first two years of college for students who ultimately want to get a four-year degree. And it's remarkable, uh, one statistic that, again, you, you may find interesting, is that 40% of the graduates from Portland State take classes at PCC at some point, 40%. So it's a huge number of people that we serve on a regular basis. We also recognize that the students who come to our doors, because of their age, because of their motivations, because of their background, have different um, learning styles. You know, when I was yay high, you know, uh, dinosaurs are roaming the earth and you know electricity had just been invented <laughs> that you know my way of learning was being in a classroom with 300 of my closest friends and copying the notes that the uh, professor put on the board in chalk or slate in the early days and and that was a traditional learning style and we're seeing now more and more people are starting to use technology in the way that they're educated and it's fascinating because we do serve people who are of my generation who are coming back to, to school, as well as the high school students who are used to technology. And it's a really pivotal point, I think, in higher education right now when we think about that. I always say, if you remember you know, the early days when, um, when we used to communicate by drawing in caves, and then we developed a language and then we developed an opportunity to write, and then we developed an opportunity to uh, build a printing press and develop libraries. And those are significant milestones as we think about the evolution of education. And we're in another one of those points right now when we think about the use of the internet. We talk about the world being flat. We talk about open access to information and communications that the, that the internet provides. So this really is revolutionizing not just education, but also the way that we learn. So our students really are taking advantage of that, and it's incumbent upon us to meet those needs, whilst also recognizing there are those people out there for which technology is a challenge sometimes. So we think about that and how it plays out into uh, community college education. The other thing I think is important is that we are the largest post-secondary educational institution in the state of Oregon. 90,000 students means that we do have a, a large uh, number of students. There are 17 community colleges in the state of Oregon. And we, uh, I guess, serve about 30%, about 28% actually, of the community college students in the state in one institution. And our campuses are also extremely large. So of the 17, there are some like us that are large, more than 10,000. We're way higher than that. And then there are some that are less than 1,000 or less than 2,000. 
serving different communities. But it does mean that Oregon is it's a really fascinating to play place to be when you think about higher education. The other thing which um, was alluded to earlier is that um, we're very well known. And um, maybe by a show of hands, how many people in this room know of somebody or themselves have taken one or more classes for credit or not for credit at PCC? Okay, let the record show that's over 90%. <laughs> it's amazing. We actually did a survey uh, a couple of years ago and we asked that very question of a good number of people in our district. And close to 70% 70 70 of people, of households that we called, had one or more people in that household who'd taken a class at PCC, 70%. 86% would recommend PCC to somebody else. And about 66% said that their experience with PCC was good or excellent, not even average. So we're doing a lot of good things. We have a lot of good press out there. And as people keep reminding me, there's no pressure on me to make sure we continue to do that. Um, but I think it's key, in essence, when we think about the community college, goes back to the thread of being a college for the community. We, in essence, have to be all things to all people at all times. All things, all of the different things that we offer, from the basic education, to a workforce development, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to all people, a broad range of people coming into our uh, classrooms across uh, our doorstep, if you will, and at all times, using a lot more technology to be out there 24-7 meeting the needs of our students. So it's, it's a fascinating thing as we think about the evolution of higher education these days. A few more facts about PCC. Since 1961, we have educated over 1.3 million people. 1.3 million people have had an education at PCC. If we think about the cumulative salary impact on an annual basis from all of those people since 1961, cumulatively, that salary is around one, just over $1 billion a year, the impact in our community. Um, a student who spends $1 on their education sees a return on that investment of about $7. Taxpayers see a return on a $1 investment of about $3.6. So it's a great investment. Education, as we know, is a good investment for the future. It's also a great investment for our community and for our economy. Um, I think one of the things that I've really learned about um, PCC is that the greatest asset that we have is the people, the faculty and the staff. And, and you kind of have to experience that for yourselves. When I run into people, um, in the street or in meetings or chatting with students, they're telling me about the interaction they've had with our faculty or our staff. And that's really, for them, been a memorable experience in a positive sense. Even though we have 90,000 people each year that we serve, we seem to be able to provide a personalized or individualized um, interaction with each and every person which I think is a tremendous testimony to the dedication of our faculty and staff. And it's very hard to do that. So I'm delighted that, that, that we have that reputation, but it also speaks volumes to the people who we employ on a regular basis. So we're delighted about that. Um, of course, I mentioned before that our Sylvania campus is the largest campus that has 32,000 students in 12-13. Uh, the Rock Creek campus, just up the road, has about 26,000 students. Uh, any one of those individual places would be seen as perhaps the second largest community college in the state. So it, it's amazing to think we can have this great district, if you will, of, of uh, um, different colleges. So those are all really exciting and really positive things. So, so let me tell you some of the things that keep me up at night, just because I want you to share my joy in some of the things that we talk about. <laughs> you know, when we talk about education, uh, and you only have to turn the TV on and, and listen to politicians in Washington or Oregon talking about education and, and realize that we're under a lot of scrutiny. People are looking at education in many ways that they hadn't before, and they're asking lots of, I think, really relevant questions. 
questions about why is college so expensive? Why is it uh, unaffordable for some people? Then um, what value do we add? So why should somebody go to college? Why should somebody pay this amount of money to go to college and get an education? Then the question of accessibility. Should we open our doors and allow everybody to come to college and give them the opportunity to, to realize their potential? And then, of course, why is the rate of change of uh, cost of going to college changing much higher than perhaps inflation? Uh, and what does that mean? Why is that important? Um, I think the other things that we're thinking about is, is a closer scrutiny on the number of people that we're turning out with technical programs a and, in essence, um, trying to meet the workforce needs. There's a lot of need out there in certain areas, but we're not able to, to produce enough welders or manufacturers uh, to meet those demands. Why is that? A and some of it, if you look at it, we actually, um, when we train a welder, it costs us more money to train a welder than we receive from the student's tuition and state resources. Um, so it's something that we have to redress and, and think a little bit about how the funding mechanism works on that front. The other thing that, of course, which is exciting, if you want to think about it that way, or a little bit worrisome, is the, the, the state's audacious goals to have a, the 40-40-20 model by, uh, by the year 2025. Forty percent of the residents of Oregon will have a four-year degree. Forty percent will have equivalent uh, two-year degree and 20% will have uh, only a high school diploma. And, and I think that's fantastic that we have this great goal that we're aiming for, and, and in essence it really allows us to, to shoot for something really audacious and, and be part of that program. But it also has a sort of a variety of different consequences in thinking about all of the things we do. How does that meet the 40-40-20 goal? The other thing is we're overhauling higher education in the state. Uh, there's a higher education coordinating committee which is looking at all things education in the state. Um, so for example, there's a discussion about uh, pay it forward. So should we not charge tuition for students and, and make them pay it back once they graduate as a percentage of their salary? That's another one which is community college should be free for everybody. And so how do we manage those things and, and what are the particular caveats? And, and of course, those things are all fantastic provided the community colleges get the money to be able to provide that education. This devil's in the details. But again, it goes back to the idea Oregon's really exciting because it's thinking about innovative and creative ideas that are not just incremental in nature but somewhat different and, and also gathering a lot of national attention for all of the things we're doing in education. Then there's the uh, Opportunity Initiative in terms of developing a, a fund uh, that will continue to um, provide resources for students for higher education for, for years to come. And, and I'm pleased that the State Treasurer has uh, taken that on as, a, as an interesting uh, idea. Then we talk about workforce development. That's also being looked at in, in, in myriad ways within the state. Is it appropriately structured right now? Are we meeting the needs? And how are we holding ourselves accountable? Then, of course, uh, we talk a little bit about uh, what are we teaching people? What value does it give to them? So let me, let me give you a great example that, um, you know, I, I'm a nuclear physicist by training, yet, you know, I don't split atoms on a daily basis uh, just for jollies anymore. Um, and I'm, you know, not pushing back the frontiers of science. I'm doing something completely different. So it's a very different skill set. In fact, Again, this high, uh, you know, my best subjects at school were French, uh, Latin, and English literature. And yet, I decided to study physics. You can draw your own conclusions from that. <laughs> but, um, but I think one of the things that's, that's really important, that it's key, is that what are we teaching people that's going to enable them to be successful throughout life? Sometimes it's not what's in the textbook. Sometimes it's not in their academic major. We talk about soft skills. And how do we then train students to pick up those soft skills that enable them to be successful? Uh, a data point that I um, learned about a few years ago was that 
If a student graduates from high school, goes straight to college, by the time they're 35, they'll have changed jobs about 12 times. And in their lifetime, people change careers many times. So what are we doing that trains people to be successful, not just for their first job or their second job or their third job, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the first career, the second career, the third career? All of those skills are really important. And actually, as we talk to uh, employers these days, they emphasize these soft skills are almost equally as important as the technical skills that students have. So how do we teach good communication skills? How do we teach good quantitative skills? How do we teach people to work as a team or to manage their time better? They're not necessarily an academic curriculum by themselves, but they are very important skills. And, and of course, it's, it's really important that we train students to show up for work on time and to be appropriately uh, deferential to the people with whom they work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those skills are, are really important for people because they will help them be successful. I think the other thing that is important is looking at finances. Um, our budget is not great, though, you know, in five years' time, we may look back and say, remember that tremendous budget we had in 2014? Uh, you know, it, it's like saying, you know, uh, this week was bad, but can you imagine what next week's going to be like? It's going to be way worse, and this is going to be a great week in comparison. But to give you a good example, uh, two biennia ago, 47% of our budget came from the state, 47%. In this biennium, only 31% of our budget comes from the state. So we're still providing a quality education. So how are we doing that? Well, unfortunately, it comes on the back of students. Our tuition has gone from being 36% of our budget to being 54% of our budget. Uh, and we're not alone in this. This is a, a national phenomenon. The states cut back on the amount of money they give to public education. But we also see it in the private sector. The private institutions, their tuition rates rise rather dramatically over time. Uh, and I think that, um, again, it goes back to the, the value-added process. So is it worth it? Are we training students to get a job, and the first job, the second job, et cetera? And those things are all, always very important questions. And I think being a public institution, it's important for us to recognize that we're using your money, your taxpayers. You're paying money for a quality experience in terms of a higher education. So we want to make sure that we're, we're using that money to good purpose. So I think that's very important that we, help, that we be held accountable and being able to be measured by the success that we have for each and every student. The other thing, of course, as we talk about, well, you know, the state's giving you less money, go out and raise money, then um, in, other sect in other parts of higher education, fundraising is really important. Uh, however, uh, even though 45% of community college students, sorry, 45% of all undergraduates in the U.S. go to community college, the amount of money that comes from private giving to colleges and universities that goes to community colleges is only 1%. 1% of all giving private philanthropy to higher education in the U.S. goes to 45% of the students. Doesn't quite seem right, does it? So it's something that we need to do a little bit better. Um, and I think when we think about it, then the value proposition for us is tremendous. And the value proposition of giving to a community college is also uh, wonderful. Our tuition is... Tuition and fees for a year is roughly around $4,300. It's a great value for money, if you think about it, in comparison to other places which may be 10 times that amount. And so we, we think carefully about, well, going for, to PCC for two years and then transferring for two years somewhere else seems like a great financial uh, decision to be made. Let me tell you a little bit about why we're excited about PCC, uh, and you should be also. Um, well, first of all, let me start off by saying thank you. A few years ago, you voted to uh, approve a bond measure, which at the time was the largest in the state, $374 million um, for construction and renovation at our different campuses. It's huge, and it really has and will have a tremendous impact for many years to come and many generations to come. So, so thank you so much for, for having the foresight to invest in that. Um, at Rock Creek, we added about 89,000 square feet of new or renovated space. 
Uh, we have a new facility at Willow Creek. Um, if you're just going by on the max and stare out the window, you can't miss that building. 100,000 square feet. It's a fantastic building. It, it's, I was just there uh, before I came over here. Um, we also have doubled the size of instructional space at the southeast campus on 82nd and Division. And that will have a tremendous impact in that community. We've also done a lot of um, new buildings and renovations at the Cascade campus, Albina and Killingsworth. And we've added 170,000 uh, square feet of renovated space uh, at the Sylvania campus. We've also built a uh, new facility down in Newburgh. It's small in size, but it serves that community well. And uh, it's enabling us to meet the needs of that community. And we're starting to have some initial conversations about a, a, uh, a partnership in Columbia County and building a, a presence out there. So we are trying to meet the needs of our um, different communities in, in this huge area that we serve. We're also, of course, undergoing a strategic planning process. And, you know, I get excited when I talk about strategic planning and, and try to get people motivated, and then they usually just, their eyes roll into the back of the head and say, not again, we did that five years ago, and look what happened. Uh, where is that plan? And so we don't see it. It's in somebody's drawer somewhere. So what we're trying to do is to have a strategic plan, in essence, with a difference. Not an incremental strategic plan, but a visionary strategic plan one that thinks about the future of this place five years from now. Actually, the best way of doing that is thinking 20 years from now, what is education going to look like, and then come back to five years, rather than saying, let's look at what we're going to do next year, and the year after that, and the year after that, because that type of planning process is not going to get us very far. It's not going to be imaginative and creative enough for us. We're basically going to decide whether the wall should be painted blue or green, rather than saying, should we have a wall there in the first place? And it's really important that we do this because, as I mentioned before, the changing nature of higher education. It's incumbent upon us to embrace these changes, to think about the opportunities that we're uh, able to, um, um, uh, I guess, uh, put into practice at our campus in many different ways. So it's really important to think creatively and innovatively. And, um, to develop, in essence, a sense of leadership amongst all different levels on campus. One of my favorite books is called 360 Degree Leadership. It talks about how you can develop leaders at all levels within a community. Um, so even people uh, in the middle area, if you might will, of the, the typical hierarchical structure can, can lead down. They can also lead across, and they can lead up. And so we need to teach those leadership skills more and have people have the opportunity to develop those leadership skills. We also want to encourage an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and the reason for that is really important. As we think about the changing nature of higher education, as we think about the thousands of colleges and universities in the US, there's obviously going to be winners and losers. And we're starting to see that in certain sectors that schools are closing down or they're struggling because they're not adapting, they're not changing, they're not trying new things, they're not being entrepreneurial. And we also need to take risks as being part of that. Higher education is probably one of the most risk averse industries that there are in the United States. And, and that's good reason, you know, I didn't get where I was today by taking a risk on what was gonna be on the exam or not, or, you know, do I need to do this or that, you know, we get where we are by being successful. We pass exams, we ensure that we've covered all of our bases and, and we don't take risks. But we are gonna have to start taking some risks and to, to try things. And, and as we all know, there's some great examples out there of, of people who've taken risks and, and not been successful initially, but they've kept at it and been successful ultimately. So as I tell people that taking a risk is actually a good thing, it means that we're thinking about new things, we're trying new things, and if we're not taking a risk, then it means that we're happy with the status quo, we're not going to evolve. I also say that, you know, if you're gonna make a mistake, I'd rather you make a smart mistake than a dumb mistake, and please don't make the same mistake twice. But <coughs> taking a risk is a good thing. It's something that's gonna be part and parcel of higher education as it becomes more driven by an entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. I think the other things to 
to talk about, as we talk about higher education, is uh, another one of my favorite uh, books called The Blue Ocean Strategy. Uh, so a blue ocean is, in essence, a new marketplace or a new opportunity where nobody or very few people exist. And so we're going to go into those sort of markets and develop them without the risk of competition rather than what we might call a red ocean where everybody's thrashing around in a very small pool uh, trying to, in essence, get that last 1% uh, from the market or improve their market share by 1% rather than going into a whole new area and grabbing 50% of that market share. You can see the difference. So that's a really exciting thing. The other thing that we're thinking about is, um, I guess, what we call BHAGs. BHAGs stands for Big, Hairy, Audacious Goals. And again, it's part and parcel of, of another book of, about businesses. So, so what goals are we going to set for ourselves that are big and audacious and, and yes, sometimes hairy? Uh, that may just be the right. But it, I think it's important that we think about those big goals and set ourselves something which is really going to be a game changer for us. Uh, and again, in higher education, uh, we don't do th enough of that as, as we move forward. So I think the, the last thing I want to touch on is talking about opportunities for partnerships, for a community. Again, we do want to hear from you about your needs and how we can suit you, serve you better. And we're also engaging the community in our strategic planning process and wanting for you to let us know five years from now, how would you have uh, signaled that we have made a positive difference in your life and met your needs as far as education was concerned. We also, of course, want to engage further the K through 12 system and make sure that the transition from K through 12 to higher education is a very smooth one. And uh, it's important to us because we do serve a lot of high school students already. And um, we have some great examples of that. So let me, uh, for example, we, know we have um, dual credit programs. A lot of high schools in our district now require students to have college credit before they graduate. We serve about 50 different high schools. Um, uh, and of those 50 high schools last year, I think it was, we had about 4,500 students taking credit from us for free. And um, there was about close to 3,000 credit hours that those students took. And in essence, it saved those students uh, overall about $2.3 million. Okay? So if you have family members who are in the school system just give them a nudge and say, you want to save some money, take some college credit courses whilst you're still a high school student. Because it does a variety of different things. It, it enables those students, obviously, to get a, an early start in college. It enables them to realize that college courses are OK, and therefore, college is for them. They, it's not something that's beyond their reach and their aspirations. And I think those things uh, certainly help us um, get that into the, the minds of the students. We have a great program with Jefferson High School on the east side called Middle College. And we've served about 440 students in that program. 95% of them have come uh, from first generation students. And what that has done for us, in essence, has really changed the, the nature of, of that environment. We have students staying in school more. The attendance rate is higher. The completion rate is higher and they're also going on to college. And they're going on to college to do actually interesting things that give back to the community. When I was out there recently talking to students, I asked them what they wanted to do ultimately. And the th three students I asked, one said they wanted to be a teacher, another one wanted to be a nurse, and another one wanted to be a social worker. Okay, they're not all going to be you know, uh, obstetricians, or they're not going to be lawyers, or something like that. They realize that it's an opportunity for them to get a job and a career that gives back to their community in, in many ways. I think the other uh, program that we're really um, delighted by is something called Future Connect that uh, has reached uh, tremendous proportions, and I'll explain why in a second. This started in Multnomah County. We've served so far 340 students, and we're currently serving about 100 students who started in the fall from both the city of Beaverton and the city of Hillsborough. And, and those two cities have put in $100,000 each to provide free education to 50 students from their cities. 
and we have matched that money. We've gone out and fundraised, and we've been remarkable in the results on that. Um, we've had, let me think, let's, we had um, about 50 students who started from Hillsborough in the fall, and we have about 48 of them who came back in the winter. We had 49 who started from Beaverton, and 49 came back in the winter. And you don't see that data on a regular basis. That data is about three times better than students who didn't go through this program. And these students are, I guess, untraditional in the sense that they're either first generation, they come from very um, meager backgrounds in terms of uh, family income, sometimes less than $20,000 a year. They may be students who are from uh, minority groups who never thought that they would go to college. And here we are giving it to them for free. And they're taking full advantage of that through the generosity of the cities and our generosity in terms of uh, fundraising to, to make sure that happens. And the reason why that's uh, exciting is that um, we've recently been able, because of the success of that program, to tell other people about it. And uh, Representative Joe Gallegos and uh, Julie Parrish have sponsored a bill that has got a lot of positive momentum in Salem. And we're hopeful that there'll be significant amount of money um, for this, uh, this initiative statewide. So it's not just things that we're doing here in Portland, but we want to share those successes throughout the state and have other people um, see the, the value in that opportunity. So those things are, are great. The other things I think we're excited about is we're reaching out more and more into high schools. And we have staff members who really, whose, whose job is to establish relationships with high school guidance counselors and high school students. And, and Heidi Edwards, who's here, is our newest example of that. She's going out, visiting schools, and telling people about dual credit, about the opportunity to come to PCC get the first two years of college and then transfer somewhere else, or just get two years of college and then get a job. Uh, we've not done this in, in, uh, with as much enthusiasm as we, we, have, um, as we are doing now, and, and we're really excited about the, the positive results from that. I think the other thing is um, we want to establish greater connections with the, the business community in terms of, again, what are your needs, training, uh, workforce development. Also, you can help us. You can help us, obviously, by hiring our graduates. You can help us by being part of an advisory council which looks at our curricula and says, you know, we need to change because students these days need to come out knowing how to do this or knowing how to do that, or in three years' time, they'll need to know how to do this, that, and the other. So our curriculum remains very uh, organic. doesn't mean that it smells. It means it changes on a regular basis, and we are able to, to remain current, actually to remain ahead of the curve, and our students therefore benefit from that advantage. We also want to engage businesses to provide internship possibilities for our students, to give them the chance of knowing what it's like to be out there in the field, putting together all of the skills they've learned in the classroom or the laboratory, and then putting that into a practical experience in the workforce. So we're looking to you to, to help us on, on that front. And then finally, um, I just want to remind you that education is a lifelong pursuit. It doesn't end when you walk across the stage wearing a cap and gown and shake hands with somebody else wearing a, an equally interesting cap and gown, because that's usually me. Um, but it goes beyond that. We want for you to realize there's a lot of things out there in terms of continuing education, community education. And we really want for our um, district to have every opportunity to have uh, a lifelong education and the pursuit of many different things that really help to develop them in, and stretch them in many different dimensions. So that's kind of like the pitch that I want to say to you today. And as usual, I'm happy to answer any and all questions you may have of me. Thank you very, very much. Hi, John Tyner. I'm a forum member, and um, th I think the question is somewhat apt. You don't have to answer it. it but you, England has a very low incarceration rate for, for individuals. It has free education. Uh, so in the last uh, decade or so, 
Oregon quadrupled its prison budget and, and uh, more than tripled its um, inmate capacity along with um, creating a huge bonded indebtedness, according to Max Williams, who, was a, who spoke here last year. Yet the corollary is that education was cut. And it, um, when all this stuff started, the, Beaver, the Portland School District was the number one uh, public school district in the country. And now I don't think anyone would say that about it. But is there any way that, we're, that the education folks are going to be able to take on the public safety lobby and say, hey, basically, we cannot continue to do this at a time when educational resources are diminishing? Um, I think you know one of the things that is important to us, obviously, is to recognize that the more that we provide people with an education, the greater chance they have of being successful and, and not sort of becoming, in essence, a tax burden by taking advantage of social services we provide. But I think on the other side of that, we do provide a lot of educational opportunities for people who are incarcerated and so who want to change their lives and who want to turn things around. And so I, I think that's another opportunity. I think, in essence, the idea of providing opportunities is, is very important uh, to a variety of different people. Uh, and if people want to reach out and grasp that opportunity, then it's our responsibility to, to give them every chance to be successful. Um, mm. and, and if they choose not to, then you know, there's, there's only so much we can do on that front. But more directly to the question, do you believe that, um, that the education folks are going to have a greater say in the legislature vis-a-vis -vis the budget issues I described? Great question, and you know, one of the things I really wanted to impress upon you today is that our budget has gone down since, uh, I guess, about seven years ago. We have less money now than we had seven years ago, and we have roughly 40% more students than we had seven years ago. So something's not quite right there. So I think one of the things that we want to engage the community with is, in essence, for you to be proponents for funding of education uh, at, at myriad levels. Certainly, uh, higher education is very important. And, and we can show that we're successful. You know, the, the, uh, the Future Connect program, the Middle College program, all the programs where we have good data to show that we're, we're making terrific progress and in changing the lives of people. And, and, and I always say, give this pitch that, we're not just changing the lives of that individual student who may be the first person in their family to go to college, but their younger brothers and sisters who then will follow in their footsteps because their parents will say, well, you know, it was great for this person. They graduated and they got a job, so now you're going to college, uh, whereas before that would never have happened. And, and I think also it changes the lives of the community and changes the lives of the sons and the daughters of those people who, um, you know, who got, had that opportunity, that chance. And so, again, we'd really like for you to talk positively in the community and, and, at, and to your local representatives about the power of education and the, the great need to appropriately fund it as a great investment in the future of the state of Oregon. My name is uh, Bill Kroger. Thanks for coming in, Dr. Brown. Very interesting. I, uh, when I went to got my two degrees, I, uh, the cost was about $100 a credit. So I see that the costs aren't up a lot by, you know, per credit, you know, not tremendously, so that's good news. <clears throat> I also taught at a community college for a year, so that was a great experience, taught English. Anyway, the question I have is I uh, served for a couple of years as the uh, National Public Affairs Director of the American Council on Education in Washington, D.C., and uh, being on the inside, I learned <clears throat> that our supposed seamless education system in this country from kindergarten to graduate school is anything but seamless. What you have is a whole bunch of groups competing against each other. You've been in both systems, obviously, from what you said in your, in your presentation. And I was just curious to see if you think that's a good thing or a bad thing or, you know, just maybe even what John was talking about with the finances. I, I was always kind of little, I, I didn't like the way some of the com competition went on because they were going after dollars, you know, and instead of trying to support each other and work with each other, it just seemed to be, you know, kind of a detriment in that regard. But yeah. Um, well, first of all, our tuition is $88 a credit hour, but um, that's a good thing. And, um, but, it, but it goes to show the affordability factor is, is really good for us. But when we think about um, the, the transitions that students make throughout their lifetime, so we have a lot of students who come to us who, whose math skills are not ready for college or whose English skills are not ready for college. 
of the students who took um, placement tests, about 80% of them got placed into non-college level math. And we had about 40% of students didn't meet their uh, college level uh, reading or writing requirements, so they got put into developmental courses. So we always look back and say, well, what are the high schools doing to address this? And then the high schools will say, well, look, we're getting these students who come to us from middle school and they are not reading at, you know, you know, and you can see, and then so the, the conversation devolves down to some one room schoolhouse in the middle of Iowa that's the cause of all of our woes. So, and clearly that's not the case. But, but, you know, as far as we see it, here is a problem, how do we fix it? And so how do we ensure that students have the opportunity to come through our doors, no matter what math or English backgrounds or other deficiencies they may have, and how do we fix that so they can get started in their college career as quickly as possible? As well as, of course, partnering better with the K through 12s to, to ensure that there's a, a, a better transition, certainly for us. And sometimes it means reaching down as far into middle school. You know, students who come to campus and take part in robotics competitions, for example. And you know, they may not know the, the really subtle details of robotics, but they get used to being on a college campus. They feel like camp that you know, college is for them. They belong there, and this is part of their destiny. So I think those things are, are really important. But I think um, we're working hard to establish stronger relationships with high schools, in essence, to, to address some of the things that you mentioned in terms of preparation for college and, and providing opportunities for us to, to partner better so that is what they teach in high school dovetailing nicely on what they need to learn in college to be prepared for college. So all of those things are really important. A lot of it is just about dialogue and getting people in the room and essentially saying, here's a problem, how do we fix it? rather than you know, going into a room and, and finger pointing, or as I always say, that we, we're circling the wagons and shooting inwards, which clearly makes no sense. So the idea is, in essence, how do we, how do we make sure that um, the students are ready and prepared, and we're not blaming each other, and we're not shooting each other in the foot just to, in essence, get the dollars to, to advance our own cause. We're in it for the students. We put students first, and we want to make sure that students get the opportunity to have a, a great education, and we need to make sure that no matter how they come to us, that we get them up to speed as quickly as possible. Jim Cape, four member. There seems to be some redundancy in the class offerings of the Twalton Hills Parks and Recreation District and PCC Rock Creek. Wouldn't it be more efficient for Washington County if PCC, if the park district focused on basket weaving and artsy classes? and PCC focuses on basic education, general education, job training, and uh, trade schools? Thank you. I think you know, a lot of it just comes down to, uh, in essence, what is the demand and where the needs are. So you know, we're so widespread through our community that we have places where we are the only place around. And so you know, we have an obligation to provide the, the educational programs that meet the, the community's needs on that front. So it's important that we think about uh, what we do and, and, uh, and whom we serve. But of course, again, not diluting what's already out there. My view, you know, in terms of, of PCC is that what we do has to be of high quality. It's our reputation on the line. And frankly, everything that we do has to reflect on the quality of the education that takes place in the classroom, whether it be for um, business development, whether it be for community <laughs> education or uh, credit-bearing <laughs> courses. So all of those things are reflected. And so we, we view ourselves as, as being the, you know, the guardians of, of quality in education as, uh, in terms of community college within our district. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Phil Nelson, forum member. And uh, a little while ago, I was checking on some figures regarding foundations. And of course, community colleges do have freestanding 501c3 tax exempt foundations, and I believe PCC does. Yeah. Uh, Rogue Community College, of all things, headquartered in Grants Pass, had by far the largest endowment in the state of Oregon among the community college foundations. And I'm wondering if you could say a few words about the PCC Foundation and what it is doing, hopefully, to uh, erase our stature here in Oregon as being about the number 46 state in the union in supporting <laughs> higher education. 
Yeah, and it goes back to, in essence, trying to help ourselves and, and raising private monies through philanthropy. And the 1% number clearly doesn't make sense. But, you know, I, I spent um, 15 years in the Ivy League. So, um, you know, and that's a well-oiled machine that's been going on for, for quite a number of time. We're, we're coming into this late in the game. Uh, and, of course, uh, starting in 61, then we're only seeing a certain number of people who've, who've in essence, um, gone on to be successful in their business and then thinking about their legacy and their sort of private philanthropy. So it's important to us that was realizing, that A, that we don't have the same machinery that other schools have and we don't have the same um, people that we have served who, are, who have that mindset about philanthropy. So we're, we're working hard to, to change that in many different ways. We do have the foundation that, that meets on a regular basis and talks about these things. And um, one of the things about philanthropy, of course, is how do, we, um, how do we use that money that we get? We can put it into an endowment or we can spend it immediately. And so there's a balance that always takes place. Last year, for example, the foundation awarded uh, about $950,000 in scholarships to students, uh, which is a, it's a lot of money every year. Uh, you know, the Future Connect program, we've raised over a million dollars. My predecessor raised a million dollars last year in his uh, opportunity program for scholarships. And so we're talking about all of those big things, but a lot of it is, um, in essence, getting out there and talking and telling our story more telling about the value of what we do, the opportunities that we provide, and the difference that we make. And I really believe firmly in that, you know, having spent you know, three years at Yale and, and 12 years at Princeton, that you know, giving $100,000 to those institutions is, is different than giving $100,000 to us. And, and we can show that we're having a, a difference on, on somebody's life, and, and it's a great legacy that we're giving and leaving behind as a, as a result of people's generosity. So. And I hate to say this, we are going to come out and ask you for money at some point. Not today. Uh, well, if you feel so inclined. But um, I want you to realize that the investments that people make in higher education for PCC really do go a long way. And we do make a substantial difference in the lives of those people because of the generosity that, uh, that the citizens provide us. So thank you in advance. Eric Squires, four member, taking up the last question. First, great presentation. Thought it was wonderful. I'm wondering if you could enlighten me to the difference um, on online versus in-class credit. And why is there no difference between a, uh, an online class, which arguably should have a lot less infrastructure behind it, than an in-person, on-campus class? Yeah, I, it's... Um Distance learning courses are very important because that's part of the wave of the future. We're starting to see that in, in many ways. And you only have to t turn on your TV set and you'll see colleges from Colorado and New Hampshire advertising for courses that they offer online and degree programs they offer online. And then there are those ones that um, advertise online that perhaps don't necessarily have the same quality. And and so we're starting to, to see, a, I guess, a a change in terms of how we view online courses. Um, online courses are not as easy as you think. You know, when I was uh, in college, that I was able to cram for the last two weeks of the semester. If I, I couldn't do that in an online class. You've got to stay current. You got, you can't think that this is something you just catch up with in the last second. And, and we also have this misconception that developing and teaching online is way less expensive than teaching face-to-face, -face, and it's not the case. Sometimes it costs us more to develop an online course than it does the face-to-face -face class. Um, we also realize that students who are taking these online classes, you know, they're logging on at 10 o'clock at night. They've put their kids to bed, they've had dinner, they've relaxed for an hour in front of the TV, and then they're ready to, to take their classes. So, so how do we meet those demands? It goes back to being all things to all people at all times. It's the all times part. I think that's very important. Um, other technologies that are out there you know, that I've been uh, playing around with is, in essence, you know, I don't know about you, but my kids, my, my elder sons who, who live with their mother, um, you know, they come and visit, and all I do is they're playing Xbox or Nintendo or PlayStation or something. And I'm thinking, they're learning a lot, by do not just all the bad things they should be learning. But in essence, if we could develop a way of, of using this as a teachable moment and providing an education, 
So what can we do in terms of virtual worlds and virtual reality to provide educational opportunities? And there's some examples out there. We were playing around with that a few years ago as, as an opportunity to do that. And even we had a, a virtual campus. Students built, uh, faculty members built their own virtual house and they sat in the backyard in their hammock and students would come in with their own avatars and ask questions about the courses, et cetera, et cetera. And it was kind of cool to see that. Um, another technology that I was playing around with was um, holographic projections. So if you think of the, the Star Wars thing where you see um, uh, Princess Leia who appears in the, the first one and, and talking about dangers, et cetera, et cetera, we can do that now. It's kind of scary. Uh, so you know, I could, I could actually be sitting in my office and talk to you and you would see me as a 3D object and I would see you and I'd be able to interact with you in, in many different ways. And I could have a stage here and I could bring in an automobile, I could spin it around and I could open up the, the hood and or the trunk and take the engine apart, et cetera, et cetera. All in front of your eyes you'd see like this 3D virtual reality. So you can think about how education is changing and, and the, the opportunities are out there. It's kind of scary. But I think the other side of it, and the cautionary side, is what value does that add to the educational process? Okay, So are students learning better because they're using new technologies? And that's a good question we always need to ask ourselves. Is an online course adding value? Some of the early online classes were basically they would take um, you know, a textbook, they would scan it and put that online. That was an online course and maybe they would have a 3% success rate because of that. Because I don't know how you do, but I would, I would not find that motivational. So, so while the, how do we teach online, which is really exciting and uses technology to its fullest? So those sorts of things. We're always thinking about new technologies, but also is it a game changer? Is it just gee whiz? Or how do we really uh, leverage that technology to our advantage? Folks, how about some applause from this great speaker? Thank you so very much. Would you linger up here for a moment? Sure. Um, folks, if you're on the PCC board or payroll, I'd love to have you come up for a photo op. <laughs> and um, uh, also, uh, in reference to Mr. Jim Cape's question, one hour of college credit will be issued for college basket weaving if you hang out and complete our board meeting follow <laughs> following uh, this meeting. So with that being said, please come back uh, next week and the week after when we uh, commence our election season. Thank you for being here, and we're done. See you, folks. Bye-bye.